Where's my where's okay. All right, it's July 13th. Okay, uh, let's start with the post V1 tracking. So V1 was released and I took all of the V1 items and moved it over to this issue. So we'll have, um, so mainly the things in here that we need to, I, I like the themes in here, it's like, it's, it's mostly documentation stuff. Like, so we have the support matrix that Fabian's working on. There's the, the API review process. All these things are kind of a part of the API review process. So that'll continue. And then um, the six scale post we one, which I saw you created. So that's the other one where I think where we wanted to go with this. So you've got the automation, right? You've got the benchmarks enhancement, and then we have some of the documentation. And then I think one of them is uh, is one of these covering like the, the rendering. I don't know if that's here. Um. I already marked that uh, issue done because we are able to get the uh, we're able to get uh, HTML pages in Cubeboard uh, website. Let me share the link. Uh, actually, if you can go to the previous issue that is linked in the um, yeah. This is an uh, 2705. Sorry, which? The, um, so in the introduction oh, section, okay. yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. This one, okay. Okay, all right, so this is the link to it. Okay, let me... Um, Oh, okay, so this is V1 release, um, periodic, okay, job and index. Oh, I thought this was, uh, so this is what we settled on. We we have, so it's the name of the CI job, the type, and then the actual HTML is in that. Oh, okay, so you have the index here, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, so the CI part, uh, I mean, the rendering part is complete. The only CI work we need is uh, to, to upload that index.html after we have scraped the data. And that is captured in the issue. Okay. Okay. Well, it sounds like we have everything then. Yeah. So um, let me see. So the well, this is where I would ask. Like the the um. So this is till June. Okay. This is release V one. So what should we expect here? Like um, this page is not going to change, or is it? Where would be like yeah. the latest stuff? I think this is not going to change. The latest stuff will be in um, weekly VMI, yeah. And then index.html here. Yeah. So that's it'll be here. Start. Okay, yes. so weekly. Okay, so then this will be so it's the thing is the Okay. Right. This is order one. To update this index.html is what we have uh, as pending item post view. Okay, so the automatic rendering of it. Okay. Yeah, if you go to the issue, um, I have it in the post view. Yeah, I have it in automation, the first bullet point. Okay. Okay, let's push some it. I understand. Okay, so and then. We have got uh, the screenshots. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. So one other thing um, I wanted to bring up for discussion here is that this issue does not capture what we want to do 
post v1 in terms of the version 1.0.0 release and its minor or um, z stream releases so um, a question i have is the like does kubebird have a schedule for a minor release or uh, how does that get decided so there's um so i actually don't know about the minor releases i think uh did we uh, i don't know if it's written about anywhere I mean, I, for some reason, I was thinking. One sec. Okay, I, I I was thinking that it had to do with um, like whenever we find bug fixes or things that we mm -hmm. want to backport, I, I think people sort of, I think they get created because like if you look at and at least this is just from what I've seen. There isn't always a minor release. So 5.9's got some, 5.8's got some. Let's see. Yeah. So with 5.9 and 5.8, those are actually Z string, right? Because of the way we did versioning before we won. Wait, so your question was with was Z stream or for the minor? So like one one dot zero or one zero one, what I think it would be. Uh, both. I assume that we'll only do bug fixes with V1. So right. if we only do bug fixes, then we, we might not have minor releases. Those will roll out as Z stream. I, but wanted to discuss that if this is being thought through or um, it's being worked on, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think what's going to happen is like, we'll get some of the, we'll get some Z streams, but then I, the next thing is, so the next thing that I, I, I it's something I have to do, I have to create the, or either me or Fabian or Daniel have to write the schedule. Like it needs, we need a, um, a release one, one schedule. So the, the way that though it should go is we're going to, we're going to get this in, you know, the usual cadence. So Got it. Months. So the next release is going to be release one one, and it's going to be three months. Uh, sorry, it'll follow the Kubernetes. Um, yeah, exactly. Maybe four time. months. Not sorry, not three, four months. So it should be um, should be the fall. Uh, that's when I think one twenty nine is released. Okay, okay, that that helps with some clarity. Okay, then my question is with the Z stream releases. So with V one point zero point one, uh, we don't have a way of tracking performance degradation. If if let's say any of the bug fix uh, causes uh, an issue with performance regression then we will not have a way to track that because we don't have the data right we don't run it on the branches correct yes okay do you have that as an item here no i don't I think we just wanted to bring it up for discussion so okay. the pros and cons is that um it will it will increase the resource utilization in terms of the actual hardware being used for tests and also storage used for storage used for um, scraping and and storing that data. So the actual utilization will go up. And and what I wanted to brainstorm a little bit is is the um, you know is 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 it worth it to go um, set up uh, bug fix releases or um, should we have some kind of like manual process where we vet it and, and only if it gets out of hand um, we'll, we'll introduce automation. I don't know, just, just sharing some thoughts. Yeah, I think, I think it's worth, I think it's worth adding. I mean, I, I don't like, we haven't really 
when I've seen run into any problems with resources, even with this uh, with this performance job running per PR, uh, at least I haven't seen anyone complain. I haven't seen even from the from the CI metrics that it was considerably worse. I actually haven't even noticed it being worse. Like it, like things being more by worse. I mean like jobs taking longer, like just being queued up because of some massive resource usage by performance. I haven't seen it. So I I don't think we're near, the, at least I don't, well, maybe we are near the limit, but I don't know if we, at least I, I don't know if, um, like I would say it's worth adding just because I don't, I don't know if we're near the limit. I, I think like it's, uh, okay. it's definitely sh shown its value and I think we can demonstrate it. And if the case comes that we need more resources, I think uh, let's, let's have that discussion for, um, before we make the judgment of not including this. Got it. Okay. So then if we say we want to include it, then the task will be, we need to set up the uh, performance job for release V1 branch. Uh, so that whenever there is a new PR, um, the changes get tracked and compare that with, with the actual benchmark before the release um, for additional information. And we'll do that for next three releases, right? And next two, until we deprecate this one. Yeah, so yeah, we'll do, yeah. We'll have, we'll, right, we'll have those, um, we'll hold on to the, all those minor release metrics and then get rid of them yeah so at any given point of time we will at least we will have at least four branches that are running post periodic jobs uh one is the main and then the the past um three yep i also don't think <clears throat> i also don't think so we get rid of them but i also don't think like we don't get that much like there aren't a ton of backports or anything like but like it's not it's not a crazy amount like usually we, like i think that's the determination of whether it's worth cutting a release is whether like how many things to get through and it's usually not that many so i guess like um yeah and and so then then the question is okay so like should we keep them um because i i think technically qbert allows at least right now it allows like people to continue to create minor releases I, I don't think people are actively doing it or like actively requesting it, but there has been some cases where people have like, with 050 or 049 or something, people have done, there's been additional releases. I think that needs to be sorted out. Like, I think that needs to be sorted out with, um, whatever I just linked the, um, I think that needs to be sorted out with the, uh, with this, uh, I don't know, this, the release support matrix. I think there's, I think what we should do here is we should follow whatever the CI uh, version is for the, the Kubernetes provider. So if like, if, if we're on 127, that should correspond to, you know, 10. For on 128, that should correspond to 11. And then we just kind of follow that window around. So in other words, whenever we, we eventually want to like drop support for those branches, like include in all our, in, inside of all our, all our repos and, and we don't want to, yeah, I guess we just do it in our repos. We probably wouldn't change CI, right? So we would just we would just stop tracking it in our repos. Is there a way to no, do we, that? Like, we will have to we'll have to um, change CI as well, right? Because we'll have to turn those post submit jobs off uh, and introduce new ones. So it will have to be both uh, change the CI to not run post submit jobs on those branches and um, drop the data from the benchmark repository. Okay, yeah, that's that's what I was getting to. Okay, so that we need to, okay, so we get rid of the, the CI stuff and then we drop the support, we just remove the directories. Okay, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I'm, I'm on the same page with you there. That's what we should do because I, I, I this is for our own, you know, storage support and for just the, the resources. I think that's the safest play. So that's the way the community is going. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Then I will reflect this in the in the tracking issue for post V one. So somehow okay. we need a way to 
keep updating the release branches uh, from the, the actual release data in, in the benchmark repository. Uh, and yeah, I'll triage that a little bit and, and add it to the issue. Okay. If there's something that we need to do, like, so I, I think the release team already updates a bunch of things, by the way, whenever we like go between releases, if, if we need to add something to the list, maybe we can talk to Daniel and be like, hey, like when, whenever we move to this new release, remove this piece of code, I, I think we'd be able to help us there. Sure, yeah. Okay, did we, okay. is there anything else? Oh yeah, okay, we wanna just add that one to your issue. Okay, yeah, what else? No, I think there one? is a couple um, in that issue. Um, if you can go back to the issue, yep. yeah. So I think there was a couple of suggestions for the en benchmark enhancement. One is um, including VM uh, with instance times and preference data. Um, I've created an issue for this. It might be uh, good to invite Lee um, sometime in this uh, call and have, have a discussion for this. Yeah, okay. And uh, another suggestion was that um, we should also add averages along with the P95 data and p50 data and i think the the technical justification there is that if you take the binomial distribution of uh, run running creation to running time and if there are peaks just before the p95 and just before the uh, p50 mm -hmm. the average will suffer but uh, because we are tracking P95, uh, the P95 will stay the same. So there, the having the average will help us understand a little bit more about the binomial distribution of these runtimes. So while the P95 and P50 are good indicators, if we want more data points on how the actual binomial distribution is um, doing, we can add um, average and get that um, visibility. Okay. The thing that, so I understand that the thing that we have to do is explain it whenever we're, so like we, we know, like right now we're handing people graphs and we have a little bit of text in the readme. So as long as we can explain it as to what its purpose is and how people can use it when they look at it, that's fine. I think, um, so I'm not sure if this will go to the benchmark, but at least for our visibility, we should have that graph. Then whether we want to ship it with the benchmark or if the explanation is enough can can be a secondary decision we make during releases, right? But at least when we are looking at the graphs for any performance problem, should consider both <clears throat> all three, P95, P50, and the average. Okay. Yeah. And then we can explain it. Uh, we can make that decision later. All right. That's fine. All right. Yeah. Okay. And then the next um, thing, next bullet point in the issue was about documentation. I think we have already discussed that. I don't have any additional discussion points there. All right, let's close stuff. So next uh, blog about explaining V1 graphs. So you've got a, something in progress, looks like, okay. Oh, is this what we? Uh... Yeah, it, the, the today's discussion is in the next page. 
Okay. Yeah, so if you can scroll down to page two. Yeah, that's. Oh, oh, here it is. Okay, gotcha. I was like, this looks familiar. I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah. got it. No, I'm using the same uh, document, but uh, different pages. Gotcha. Okay, so I I did a little bit of uh, brainstorming as to how, what or what kind of data can go into this digital blog post that will be helpful to readers. Um, the thing I came up with is this um, five bullet points. So we want to introduce what we are doing. We want to show the benchmarks. Then help a little bit on how to interpret these graphs. So these graphs have some kind of um, esoteric thing which only people involved with this um, can understand. So we want to decode that a little bit. Then um, explain how this can be helpful for, let's say any other uh, project that is using a CRD and controller. And with this, we, we kind of need the tooling as well. So that becomes a sub point that what tools are used um, in order to set this up and, and how you can do it for your project. So those are the items I had in mind. Trying to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think wait a minute. Wait a minute. So I follow that. Um, let me think. Yeah, I mean it makes sense as a as an outline here to as a direction. Um I'm trying to think like in terms of developer blogs. So we want so how how much do you want to go like how, how much do you think we should go into um so we say like intro show benchmark graphs you should tell them what it means what do you think the most detail is going to be like which of these bullet points i think is going to have the most detail i think um three and four right okay so in three, what I'm thinking is we show uh, we show explain the graph, then show its usage by um, tracking one or two PRs. Right. Um, okay. So this bullet point will be to the developer and this would mean, okay, here's how I can see how Qbert's performance changed on a per PR basis. Right. So what, um, what I want to highlight here is how this tool or strategy that we are using can help achieve this find performance degradation and, and the actual PR that cost it, right? The source of degradation. Okay. Okay, so now that okay, that follow that. So there's our that's like our thesis. Okay, so now this part. So now what are we gonna say here? Um, like is it gonna be how you can find in your downstream commits, whether you're, if you have got a performance regression, is that where this would go? Yeah. So there are two things here. Uh, either we take this to how to get similar benchmarks um, set up downstream, or we make this generic and say, 
how to get similar benchmarks for your project. And then because this is a generic thing, it extends to people who want to do this downstream as well. So when you say your project, you mean someone that is using Kubert, not someone that's like got a controller in the Kubernetes community. No, I mean the second one. Uh, the second one, the okay. Yeah. So kind of towards the, like what we were thinking for the KubeCon talk in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I am not a little bit um, clear on as to what will be the best transition because there are two points, right? We, we need to be careful about the length of this post, blog post. And if we put a lot of things in here um, for, let's say, your project, which is the controller and CRD, this post can get really big. Maybe what we do is we 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 focus on one of them. I mean, there, this can be. I mean, there are, there's opportunity for multiple blog posts. Maybe the so maybe this one. So this is focused. Like maybe let's say if we focus on like what I'm sure. Like I'm, this kind of like almost writes itself. The title almost writes itself. It's like it's like by our understanding performance regressions and your Qbert deployments, right? We have production users, they use this stuff. They have likely some custom commits on top, right? Maybe if it's, even if it's just one or two, that is still valuable to know. So if you're someone who's, who's coming across this blog, you'd be interested if you have a production deployment of Qbert downstream. Now, the other part of this is what you're saying, which is point two, which is that the KubeCon title. That one would be like for the developers, the community. So maybe that one, we can try to go to like CNCF for that. Right. So there is another alternative. Um, what I was thinking is the, the downstream part of this material can go in the uh, tooling uh, user guide that we are thinking for um, in the post v1 issue. So we can tackle it there. It will not go, it could, I mean, we could skip it in the uh, blog and just link it from the tooling section with like one or two line here in this section. So we, we would be like, Kubeword community tracks this here and has found it useful. If you want to do this for your downstream deployment, here is the here is how you could do it and link the the user guide that has tooling and and every thing needed for setting it up. And then we can focus it for for the we can focus this post for wider. Um, Kubernetes development. Well, so what I'm thinking is like, if we want to go the Kubernetes route, like, I think we should try and go, like, Kubernetes is a good blog, but we can always try and go to other places because, like, the CNCF has its own set of blogs. I mean, I don't see why not. Like, if, like, if we want to focus this towards people who create controllers, like, why not go toward the CNCF for the blog like that? I mean, that's what the audience is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, uh, so I want to kind of focus the discussion on what content we should come up with and select the content because there is a lot here. Um, once we, you know, brainstorm what content will be best we can probably decide where this post will go and right well so i follow you but the thing is if but the i think what you're leaning toward though is that this fourth bullet point being towards the community and so if we want to like if that's the if, if that's the way that we want to go what i'm saying is like i i think there's really one good place this belongs 
right, yeah. right. Like, and, and, and so if we want to do a blog post that's about like end users, right? I think it's a great spot for in Qvert. We're focused on Qvert. And, and the thing is like, we could talk about this. We could tie it in with V1. Like, I think there's a, definitely a Qvert blog post to be written. I also think there's one for the CNCF. I, I mean, I don't, I think it's fine we do both. I mean, I, like it's, I think really what ends up happening here is that I don't think if you split them apart, I think they're not that long. Like I think they're they're not extremely long and you have, and they have nice illustrations. Like I think Got they're it. both, um, I, I think like it's not, like if when we look at it in com combine, it becomes a lot of work, it becomes a long blog. So but I think we should decide on which one we'd like to at least start with. Maybe we, V1 was just released. If we want to use the momentum from V1, I mean, I think where we should go is this direction is that we should go towards yeah. doing this and then and then don't do the controller, the general controller blog, not yet. I and mean, then we can do that in maybe in August. I mean, the other thing we got to think about though, is that we, so the, in August, the KubeCon talks get selected. And we obviously don't know whether we're going to be selected or not. If we, based on what happens, like maybe, let's say we aren't selected, it might not be a bad idea to write a blog post to the CNCF about this, just to raise some awareness of the topic and then possibly give it a talk after that based on the, the blog post as a way yeah. to get interest. Makes sense. Yeah, I think that, um... And even if it is accepted, right, we could still write the blog post to get interest from talk. I mean, then mention the talk as part of it. So I mean, it's sort of like a win-win. I think if we if we look at it that way, but we just would have to, and it gives it the timeline lines up too. Like we just would have to wait till August. Yeah, I I think I I agree with you. So we can use the momentum to um, publish this part of the content for Qbert, and then. And then as we get close to the talk, if it gets accepted, the material prepared here can be, you know, brainstormed and ironed out in a way that, you know, uh, it could either use some for the talk and some for the blog post. I'm gonna do it like this. How to use the bench similar benchmarks for your controller. So those would be the yeah. one and the two. So the plan we'll call this is we'll call this your down. They're going to call it production. And then this would be the community, the CNCF one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that direction makes sense. So for this one, do you think the user guide um, user guide documentation will be a prerequisite? Uh, I think I think we should. Have, I think it would be really nice to have. Like, I think maybe what we can do to shorten our blog is to have the user guide with a lot of detail, and then we kind of do a high level in the blog and then point to it for the people that are interested for more. Because I think there's a lot of things here. Like we have Prow, we have Prometheus, we have like all these, we have Grafana, we've got all these tools that all sort of make it all come together. And what we can do in this blog is mention the fact that we've set these things up and how we use them. And then inside of the, the user guide, it talks about like how you can use them. Makes sense. So I think uh, with that, this user guide setup should be our one of the highest priority for uh, post V1 issues. Uh, because that will help us um, draft this post better. Mm. Yeah, I think we need the user guide. And, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, agreed. Okay. Yeah, I think we are on the same page. Um, 
we have a strategy. Okay, I'll so okay. I'll set with this and uh, all right, so we'll go to the next one. I, I only mentioned, I only had a KWAC here for the question because I, I, cause I know you sent me some of the stuff we've been doing. I mean, do we want to talk about this at some point? I don't know if like what your plans were, I think we could to see at some point in the community. Sure, so um, I can give a little bit of um, a background on what's happening here. Um, We've discussed this before. Quark is a project which allows us to run resources without um, actual kubelet. So we can fire up our virtual machine instance um, where the virtual controller creates the um, pod, which is actually not running, but its status um, shows running and it's not backed by any um, hardware. The in order to fully support a virtual machine um, instance API, we need to fake out the word handler uh, parts because word handler takes the pod that is in schedule phase and uh, moves it into running phase. So I've been doing uh, some work and I have a short one minute demo where you can see you can create a fake node. You can create a, a fake BMI. The word handler, sorry, word launcher pod gets um, running there. The BMI goes to schedule phase. And then this fake uh, extension of walk um, transitions BMI from scheduled to running state. So there, and then, it does this with a little bit of a jitter. So Quark has a functionality where you can transition from one state to another and add uh, delay seconds and jitter period. So what I have right now is 10 seconds as delay and 15 seconds as jitter period. So what I expect is that the VMI will be transitioned between 10 to 15 seconds and, and that jitter period will be picked up um, at random. So that okay. takes care of um, schedule to running. The second thing we need to take care of is word handler also removes um, finalizers during a cleanup. So when, when the fake VMI is deleted, the pod will be, the word launcher pod will be deleted, but the finalizers on VMI will still be there. So then the Quark VMI controller will come in instead of the word handler, it will remove the finalizer and the deletion will go through. So you need a, you need a controller in KWAC that understands virtual machines? Not precisely virtual machines, but... Or the pods? So it would be the virtual launcher pod. No, 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 not really. So because these are uh, fake objects, you can have a state transition uh, of this object. So all the quark uh, controller needs is an input that it's watching the VMIs for one state and it is going to transition from this state to the next state. So for example, for schedule to running, the conditions I have is that dot metadata dot deletion timestamp is not specified and dot status dot phase equals to schedule. So if it is in this phase, then the transition from schedule to running with a jitter reader will kick in. So that's one state. Who, sorry, who does that though? Who, who does that? Who actually does the state transition? Uh, Quark VMI controller. Quark VMI controller. Yeah, that's, that's the so extension not, I have that's, added. That's, so is that what you're saying? Is that what, you're, is that what the fake word handler is? Yes. Oh, okay. So the, okay, okay. 
So you have an extension of quark and that is faking the word handler. Okay, I get it. Okay, so, yes. Uh, and it doesn't actually need to understand all of the VMI logic. All it needs is an input of what state the VMI is in and where it needs to transition it. Okay. I see, okay. Yeah. And then the second example I was talking to about, the input is that metadata dot deletion timestamp is set and then uh, remove the finalized. So if that is the input, then the fake VMI controller will remove finalizers. If okay. the scheduled state is the input, then it will it will transition it into running state. Got it, okay. Um, so that's the uh, background of the work um, I've been doing. The, so in this case, do you, um, do you have, to have a special deployment of Qvert? Because I can't imagine you have to have, so actually maybe you don't because you have fake nodes, right? So you must have the KWAC controller watching those fake nodes and then its extension right. handles the work. Okay, so I guess you don't. So you just need, you right. do need keyword deployed to get the APIs though. And you need some of the, you need vert API and vert controller running, right? So, okay. And then, and then this takes care of the fake node part. Okay. Right. So we need the keyword deployment and the quark deployment. Uh, and both of them will not intersect with one another. So for example, quark fake VMI controller will not work on actual running VMIs. It will only work with VMIs that are scheduled on fake nodes. Right, right, okay. Makes sense, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna so characterize then, it. So it requires a keyword deployment with the, with, and KWAC with a keyword. I'm gonna just call it a keyword extension. Or, uh, I don't know if that's the right terminology, but basically yeah, what no, you did you're here. Right. Okay. Yep. So the next part, um, so we, I'm still figuring out um, how to abstract things. This is just a POC. Ideally, what should be, so once we prove out value with POC, um, we should be able to have a decent enough abstraction where we don't need custom controllers for all uh, extension, right? So then we can go to um, the uh, Quark maintainers and say, here's how you can extend it without maintaining custom controllers. And that way we will have just a few configuration of KubeWord specific resources and use vanilla uh, quark deployment to run um, fake VMIs. So that's the end goal, but it's a long way out. Um, we first need to figure out whether the data points coming from fake VMIs is actually helpful in the scale test. Okay. Yeah. So that's the next step um, we're going to take is find out what is the difference with fake and normal VMIs in resource utilization of the control plane with a scale test and improve, bring it close to the actual VMIs and then um, you know uh, work on the abstractions. Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, so this leaves us a little bit of um, open question as to when exactly can we bring this in um, in the KubeWord and, and in our uh, KubeWord post-submit jobs. The answer is I don't have a plan yet, not at least until 
we can find out the difference between the actual scale, uh, like the actual resource utilization of VMI and the fake one. Once we have that, we can brainstorm a little bit on how we can leverage it. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, this is cool. Let's definitely look forward to this. Like, we talked about this a long time ago, like basically when six scale started. I don't even think KWAP exists, and we talked about this idea. So this is cool to see. Yeah, I think what would be good to um so what are the things we can do with out of box keyword and um quark deployment is that we know that the word controller is not uh fake. And we know that word API is not fake. So we can understand the scaling and performance behavior of word API and word controller without any improvements um, or additional um, development with just what we have today. But the problem is that our metrics are not categorized into components. So we don't know from the benchmarks or the metrics that we track, which is generated by word controller and which is generated by word API. So the only higher level aggregation we have is memory and CPU usage. And that's where we can start with for now. Okay. Good. Cool. Okay. Okay. All right. Definitely looking forward to that one. Cool to see. It's just one of the, right one of our limitations for a while now is some hardware. So it'll be good to see how this comes out. Okay. Cool. I think that's all we had, Olay. I mean, anything else do you have? No. Nope. I think that's it. Okay. All right. Cool. I think we'll end over there. All right. Thanks. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Oh, okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.